Steps Ahead, brought to you by the Model Railroad Industry Association, helping hobbyists design and build their own miniature railroad empires, inside or outside, big or small. Cotto, manufacturer of precision railroad models and the Unitrack system. Hi, I'm Spencer Christian. On this episode of Tracks Ahead, we'll visit a man who turns junk into model railroad treasures. We'll talk with artist Bruce Frisch and go to Omaha, where we'll find a steam railroad has center stage. New Zealand has been called one of the most beautiful lands on Earth. In both the North and South Islands, you can find almost every type of terrain imaginable. You'll go from glaciers to rainforest, fjord to farmland, and you can do it all by rail. It is a country that is perhaps even more down under than the land down under, New Zealand. It is a country that um, is not overrun by tourists. It's a country that a lot of people haven't been to because of the remoteness. Um, we get people who come on the tours and they, uh, they, uh, they think that um, people still walk around in grass skirts. They uh, have some pretty far-fetched ideas about what we're about. But, uh, and I think that comes from the fact that there are so few people who have been here and it's uh, magnificent. But, yeah, the locals are genuinely interested in finding out about, about tourists and tourism and uh, it's, it's great. The Australian Pacific Tour Group. And to see it, to see it slowly and allow it all to unfold before you, step aboard a train. It's a relaxing way to see the countryside. And the railway lines follow totally different from the main road, so you're seeing different countryside. I just like trains. I like the movement of trains and the noise of trains. The Geyser Land is just one of many trains crisscrossing this unique land. It heads out of Auckland, bound for Rotorua, a place that has that not quite finished feel to it. It's pretty crazy here. Yeah. Rotorua, uh, right throughout that volcanic belt, I'm in an area that's uh, Part of the uh, the Pacific Rim of Fire. I mean, two thirds of the world's active volcanoes come from that area, and we're right straddling the middle of that uh, zone. So you're getting the boiling mud pools, you're getting geysers, you're getting uh, crazy things happening with uh, volcanic activity, and uh, related to that as well, earthquakes. So they call this country the Shaky Isles, and I guess uh, it creates a, a pretty dynamic place. The Overlander train moves you through country that changes as you gaze out the windows. New Zealand is like that, always different through the glass. It's a country that almost seems to be playing tricks on you, teasing you into thinking you've got it figured out, and then changing again. Then within the short spaces of time, uh, within a one hour period, you've gone from an extremely dry part of the country to uh, one that's unbelievably wet. So, yep, there's a great variety within uh, yeah, kind of a short time frame, so it does, it keeps it interesting for people as they move around. Inside, things are civilized, and service, although not meant to be fancy, is a priority. What did I ask for? So far we have a shepherd's pie toast sandwich, the muffin. Mm -hmm. All the trains have buffet car snack bars, you, you eat, drink, you've got toilets and carriages, so it's a great way to travel rather than by bus. The Overlander lets you off near Tongarero National Park. It's a rocky expanse of snow-capped peaks and infinite views. Napier is a gem of Art Deco close by the coast. It's preserved a feel of another time, just another angle of this varied land. While the insides of trains like the Bay Express leaving Napier for Wellington look pretty much the same, it's what's outside that strikes the traveler as special. New Zealand is indeed a small country, but to see its many facets, it takes all the trains this country has to offer, and motor coaches, and even boats. It's a ferry that bridges the gap from Wellington to Picton. Again, New Zealand changes as you inhale the salt breezes. Once in Picton, it's on to the Transcoastal, truly a train that lives up to its name. There are planes that could cart you from one spot to another, and some used to take that option. Well, I used to, uh, but now I think you have to take time and look at what's around you. Well, 
well in flying, you're not going to see a great deal. Um, because at this speed, you're able to take in everything, the breathtaking scenery. It's a bit different looking from something from a 20,000 feet up just to three feet off the ground here. And you're able to see every single thing and uh, it, you're able to appreciate what you're seeing. Taking your time here has some wonderful payoffs. It's such a scenic journey and a beach driving. Well, there's so, so much, uh, so many sheep and cattle and uh, deer and uh, all the new little born lambs, which are just lovely. And uh, the greenery, the greenery is the thing. Uh, the thing I like because I was brought up in the red dust of the centre of Australia and the greenery is just beautiful. One of the highlights of any train excursion through New Zealand is the Transalpine. You start off in Christchurch in the morning and uh, you travel up across the Canterbury Plains which is an area that was, it's been underwater several times over millions of years in evolution. So it's a very flat area, the largest flat land in the country. Um, crop farming, sheep farming, um, but very, very dry and fairly barren. And then uh, once you get up to the mountains you start winding your way through some more steep terrain up to, uh, towards the Southern Alps and uh, then of course you're, you're away from the wet part away from the dry part that is, and uh, up into snow-capped peaks and you get some of those snow-capped peaks right throughout the summer as well. Um, winding your way down the other side you've left what is essentially a very dry part of the country getting into an exceptionally wet part so uh, it's a great big braided wide river beds and uh, clear fresh water. When the snow's down it, it looks just that much more spectacular. And some people have never seen snow before, so when they come along they see the mountain ranges covered in snow and they just think it's marvelous. It's a fantastic journey. And they're right. It is a fantastic journey. Ranges of mountain tops and valleys roll away to the horizon as you roll along through the country. I would say it's uh... It is, a, it is a, a journey which, which gets you really close to the mountains on a train, and uh, that for a lot of people is a real highlight. And from the Transalpine, it's an Alpine coach ride to this, another serious highlight of New Zealand, Milford Sound. Well, this region here, Milford, is uh, unbelievable. It's, it's a region which has been carved out by glaciers about two mil million odd years ago. It's a region which um, we're seeing only a half of what is there. Uh, you've got uh, an incredible dense rainforest around us, literally growing on the sides of very, very steep cliffs. Um, an amazing abundance of different types of wildlife um, above the uh, above the sea, and then down underneath us, we've got a thousand feet down to the ocean floor. Um, things like some of the oldest animal species in the world, the brachiopods, um, and a good population of them. We've got black corals, which are very rare coral species and uh, one of the largest single populations of those found in the world is found here in Milford, so pretty amazing place. And a drop straight off the side of Mighty Peak, just under 100 metres or just over 300 So Well, it's so dynamic every time you go the there, it's side. different. I mean, I've been into Milford Sound, goodness, dozens of times. And every time I go in, it's different. You've got different lights, you've got different uh, weather conditions. Some days you go in there, it's bright and sunny, and uh, you can see the tops of mountains 5,000 feet above you. Um, other times you go in there and it's, it's raining and, and uh, like we saw, uh, waterfalls by the, by the hundreds. Um, but every day is different and every part of the season is different too, so it's a pretty awe-inspiring place. Yeah. It is another kind of awe that's inspired in Queenstown, the radical kind. <laughs> Queenstown is a self-proclaimed extreme sport capital of the world. It was here that a couple of guys dreamt up the idea of leaping off tall things like bridges while attached to thick rubber bands, bungees. Now the area is a kind of mecca for adrenaline junkies. And it's on the list of a lot of rail fans as well. This is the home of the Kingston Flyer. I think it's just the permanence of the thing. I mean, it's something that doesn't change very much. We live in a very fast changing world and somehow steam trains always seem to be part of our past, which is still here. It's lasted. Lasting thing, yeah. If you spend any time at all riding the rails of New Zealand, you can't help but be struck by how much love there is for the place and for these trains. It's a feeling that the locals want you to take with you, along with your souvenirs and memories.
If you call some people cheapskates, they are quite offended. But that's not the case with everybody. We found a gentleman over in Connecticut who thinks being called a cheapskate is one heck of a compliment. And he's put together an impressive layout with less money than you could ever imagine. All right, stainless steel. If you've ever wondered what type of person goes shopping at the local Aluminum. junkyard, Brass. meet Maurice DeCoster. If you like neighborhood rummage or tag sales, you'll like Maurice DeCoster. He's the kind of guy who goes to the tag sale or the local junkyard and buys uh -huh. the things you're absolutely, positively sure no one would pay a penny for. Some of the things I've found include uh, my basic building materials. For instance, uh, working in an outdoor environment, you want moisture resistant wood. Uh, I use mahogany scraps. Uh, I've got teak. I use uh, redwood that I've picked up. Uh, uh, for instance, somebody getting rid of an old uh, redwood or cedar picnic table uh, it gives me a supply of wood uh, that I can use for a whole year in building the railroad. I also pick up uh, things such as uh, children's uh, action figures or toys, uh, which I can modify and make into figures for the railroad. I may find vehicles which are useful. Uh, and then just miscellaneous things like uh, uh, interesting uh, plumbing or electrical fixtures which I can use to simulate uh, rooftop structures or detailing in a, in a, uh, in a uh, yard next to a gas station. It's certainly true that one man's junk is another man's treasure. Just take a look at what Maurice DeCoster has put together with items he's found at rummage sales, junkyards, and recycling centers. This is the Connecticut Central. It's also low-cost garden railroading. DeCoster built this 250-foot-long compressed dogbone layout in his back garden. When he decided that a garden shouldn't have just pretty flowers, it should have something that moves. I uh, would like something to be uh, interesting, unusual. Uh, I would guess I'd use the word plausible. It doesn't have to be scale. It doesn't have to be 100% historically accurate. But somebody looks at it and they see a complete scene and say, gee, that's, that, that is possible. It could have been that way. But I also like to do that very inexpensively. OK, let's start with a look at the roadbed. Free compost, wood chips, and topsoil from the city recycling center. Styrofoam roadbed, because styrofoam is cheap. Take a look at the track. Maurice estimates it cost him about 50 cents a foot. All of it was hand-built, except for the turnouts. The Redwood Railroad ties were cut from an old scrap picnic table and glued down. Bulk rail was fastened with common nails. Now let's take a look at some of the structures. He built them all at a cost of less than two bucks a building. How in the world, you're asking, did he do that? We built a coaling tower uh, in the house on top of the coaling tower is constructed of a styrofoam base uh, to which uh, cedar planks, which were ripped out of old house siding, are applied. Uh, the roof is tar paper, which is scribed. Uh, and it all sits on top of uh, three coffee cans, uh, which are uh, glued together, screwed together, uh, around which painted tar paper is put. Uh, it is all sitting in an old plastic shelf, so it can be lifted up and detailed. Uh, the whole structure probably cost me two or three dollars in terms of the materials that are in it. Uh, it was a lot of fun to build. And in building it, I didn't follow any particular plans. I think I had seen a picture of a model that was being offered for sale in one of the hobby magazines. And I said, you know, that would be an interesting structure. So I proceeded to put one together. When you walk into any garden railroad display, the first thing you see are the roofs of the buildings. For this reason, DeCoster puts extra attention and some unusual materials on his roofs. In a garden railway, uh, if you stop to think about it, what do you see uh, most 
uh, or best, you see the roofs. And I think uh, putting details on roofs make them more realistic. I was uh, quite nicely complimented. Uh, uh, last week we were visited by friends whose young daughter uh, just completed architectural school. And what was the first thing she noticed? Lo and behold, it was the roof. She said, boy, those look realistic. The rolling stock and locomotives fall in the economical category as well. Many are secondhand. He applies an old weathered look, which obscures the imperfection of a quick, cheap paint job. It's worked out so well that he's building a second steam layout right next to the Connecticut Central. A little more whimsical with a Hollywood theme but just as reasonably priced. And by the way, all the plants, they were pretty cheap too. Many were acquired at end of the season sales at the local garden center. All in all, this is his rule of thumb. If it requires too much time or money, don't do it. Now would you call that cheap or just plain smart? Maurice says he gets great satisfaction knowing that he has the kind of garden railway that just about anyone could build. All you need is a little effort, a little know-how, and very little money. Many of us have some sort of artistic talent, and we probably wish we had more. Wouldn't it be great not only to be able to see things of beauty, but to recreate that beauty for others to enjoy for many years to come? We'll meet a Wisconsin man who uses his time and talent to create a treasure. But first, Omaha is famous as home to the Union Pacific Railroad. But there's another line that's making a name for itself in Omaha, and this one features tigers and cotton candy. Nope, it's not Africa, but some of the scenery is familiar. It's the Henry Dooley Zoo in Omaha, Nebraska, and it's quite a ride. It's very difficult to make an interesting zoo or an interesting botanical garden or interesting anything on, on a piece of flat ground. You know, people who start out with flat ground end up uh, building, making their own mountains and building mounds of dirt. Um, and what we've done is taken the existing park, which was, had been, you know, around a long time and with a lot of mature trees, um, and, and tried to keep most of the park as an open park, um, you know, which is where the railroad uh, runs through. The 119 is the centerpiece of the zoo rails. While it chugs right along, filled with happy passengers, it wasn't a neat fit when it arrived back in the 60s. The old 119, um, uh, you know, was originally built specifically for this park um, in, in 1968 by Crown Metal. And, um, and we, we kind of had difficulties with it from day one because uh, we had a couple of grades here that, uh, that went to 6% um, and we had some very tight curves. And so over the years we have tweaked and tuned it, tuned it up and also uh, lowered the um, you know, lowered the, our grades on, on our two bad hills and, and also pushed our curves out by um, uh, considerable so that, uh, uh, you know, the, the apparent grade that the locomotive saw was left. But then two years ago, we tore the old 19 down, clear down to the frames, and did a complete rebuild. Um, so it is. Uh, other than the fact that most of the iron is old, it's, a, it's literally a brand new engine. Of course, people don't just come here for the train. The zoo is home to an IMAX 3D theater, a massive aquarium complete with sharks and penguins, something you'd never see in the wild, and, back to the train theme, this awesome engine house. Eventually, as Union Pacific decided to close their shops down here in downtown Omaha, uh, they allowed us uh, to come in and um, they essentially donated some machinery to us uh, for us to use in the repair of our locomotives, as well as uh, donating us funds to build the locomotive or to build the engine house here, uh, so that we could put the equipment in here, as well as the locomotives uh, for us to work on them then ourselves. 
When you hop aboard, it's off on a wild journey. You're carried along smoothly, riding on the 30-inch gauge line. Let me take you back for a moment. This is reminding me of another Tracks Ahead piece. Let's compare. Africa, Omaha. Africa, Omaha, Africa, Omaha. There are definitely some bonuses to riding the wild rails in Nebraska. Little things like stroller-friendly walkways and fences to keep the wild things just out of striking range. Plus, no malaria shots, no political turmoil, and when the ride is over, you can grab an ice cream cone. Just try that in Africa. Bruce Frisch is a powerful man. He has the power to transfer power onto paper. The power of a streamlined Hudson 464, which was built for speed, built to pull the Milwaukee Road Hiawatha. The power of a 460 10-wheeler, a tough old locomotive which was ideal for medium speed, multi-stop workhorse trains. The power of a 482 Mikado, one of the most popular freight locomotives ever built. Bruce Frisch understands the power of a locomotive, and he has the ability and imagination to capture the image for the rest of us to appreciate. I like the paint trains because they uh, have uh, more class, uh, or especially the steam engines have more class than the diesel engines because they have the smoke and the steam and uh, the drive rods and the valve gear, they got that extra movement and, uh, and it gives them just that much more sight and sound than a diesel engine. Art is Bruce Frisch's vocation and his avocation. He's a full-time technical illustrator and graphic artist. His time away from the office is spent here in his home studio. Hour after hour is spent capturing a single moment that fraction of a second when the train rolled by. A moment which is frozen in time. And he concentrates on trains and memories from the Midwest. Trains and memories that are close to home. Well, I concentrate on the Chicago Northwestern, the Sioux Line, and the Hiawatha because uh, there's a lot of interest and memories uh, from the, uh, those railroads. Uh, many people uh, remember the trains they remember riding them, uh, watching them, and also family members working on them. Uh, they also remember the train depots in the cities and towns. Like many artists, Bruce Frisch is quiet and humble. He lets his art do the talking, and his art says it all. You can purchase prints of almost everything Bruce Frisch has done. Thanks for being with us and please join us next time for more Tracks Ahead. Tracks Ahead, brought to you by Kalmbach Publishing Company, bringing you Model Railroader Magazine every month for over 65 years and Garden Railways Magazine, helping you take the fun of model trains outdoors. Cotto, manufacturer of precision railroad models and the Unitrack system. Walters, manufacturer and supplier of model railroading products serving the hobby since 1932.
the Model Railroad Industry Association, a not-for-profit trade group for professionals in manufacturing, importing, packaging, or publishing model railroad merchandise.